Last week they had Brady. This week they got Brady. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. As a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PFL. Ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right. We're going team by team. I would be very careful by sling and stuff. Am I going to get sued? We got legal on this? I like the ball, like football season, all the things that go with it. Just when you think you have a handle on the new NFL season, you find out that Jordan Matthews just signed an NFL contract and you're wondering whether you've slipped into some kind of coma and it's actually 2015 all over again. <sighs> it's a rough one, Trev. It's a rough one this morning, but we're going to help try and navigate this crazy NFL world. Um, and helping me do that will be Trevor Sikama. How's it going, sir? It's not a rough one for me, or who Matthews. like Jordan Matthews coming out of the draft, or... Brad Spielberger, who is a noted Vandy football <laughs> diehard. So, you know what? The guests of the PFF NFL show are having a good morning, Sam. So, I don't know about you. You're right. It's a good day for former Vanderbilt Commodores and uh, Jordan Matthews and all stands of Jordan Matthews. Uh, so, shout out to all of those people. Um, we're not going to be talking too much about Jordan Matthews' contract, so I don't think that's going to be a big deal. But we're going to dip into the mailbag as well as hit some uh, various other things throughout this show. Um, but before we do that, there's just enough time to start talking about fixing your family's financial future, starting with life insurance. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it quick, easy, and affordable to protect your family so you can get back to enjoying life. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high-quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Fabric has flexible policies that fit your family and your budget with quality policies like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. Get your personalized quote in minutes and then apply when it's convenient for you. It's all online and on your schedule. You could go from start to covered in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in minutes at meetfabric.com slash PFFNFL. That's meetfabric.com slash PFFNFL. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash PFFNFL. Policies issued, ugh, policies issued by Western Southern Life Insurance Company, not available in certain states, prices, subject, underwriting, and health questions. All right, Trev, let's start off dipping straight into the mailbag because uh, myself and Brad, I think it was Brad, right, did a segment last week talking about the fact that uh, flag football is going to be in the Olympics. Um, we gave what our team would look like or should look like, uh, and we had an email in from somebody called David uh, Raffetzeder who apparently is from Austria. Dear PFF NFL Ooh. podcast team, as a flag football player in the top division in Austria, I'm thrilled by the recent news of flag football being added to the Olympic Games in 2028 and the hype around the sport that the news has sparked around the world and even in the NFL. As a huge fan of the show, I love that you added a segment about flag football to the latest episode of the podcast. While I think you absolutely nailed it with your selection on offense, there are some thoughts about the selection of defensive players that I want to share with you. The way that flag football is played, according to the IFAF rules, which will also be the rules for the Olympics, as far as I know, is that defense basically consists of a blitzer and four defensive backs. The job of the blitzer is obviously to rush the passer, starting from seven yards behind the line of scrimmage. I think Micah Parsons, with his athleticism, is a great pick for that position. However, I disagree with adding a linebacker to the defense, as this position basically doesn't exist in flag football. I would argue that adding cornerbacks or safeties who are capable of playing both off uh, man coverage or zone would be most beneficial. But all in all, I think you did a great job outlining the skills that are required for playing flag football. Once again, thank you for giving my sport the platform and sparking such an interesting discussion. Keep up the great work. Kind regards, David. Uh, so thank you for the feedback. I'm curious what your team would look like, Trev, for flag football. NFL players headed to the Olympics in 2028. Okay, I'm, all right. I have not read the exact rules, so can you like so, just speed run it for me? Like, for, how many players do I have to choose from? How many are on the field? So what it's five it like? five guys aside. For offense, we were running with a quarterback, a running back, and uh, two two wide receivers, and a guy who was being labeled tight end slash center, i.e., the guy that snaps the ball and then goes. Okay, out so pattern. somebody does have to snap the ball and yep. then they go out for a pass. Yep. Okay, I mean, this the center is. 
obviously Kelsey, right? Which one? You're like, <laughs> what'd you say? Which Kelsey? <laughs> well, <laughs> Jason, uh, Jason, just okay. for just for kicks. No. Um, okay, so the center would be Travis Kelsey. Um, I think the receivers would be Tyree Kill. Justin Jefferson. Wait, you only get two? Two you of them. Two wide receivers? Yep. Okay, I think I think those would be my two. The quarterback would be Mahomes, obviously. Yeah. And then Honestly, like I might put Tyree Kill like in the in the backfield. Like I might put Tyree Kill, Tyree Kill just because, like you know, if because that means that he, no matter what, would have like a running head start every time before he even got to the line of scrimmage. I like so that. So I might put I might put Tyree Kill at running back, and then God, receive the second receiver spot is difficult. Who did you guys go with as the second receiver? Uh, who do we go with? Tyreek Hill was the one that we both had. Uh, of course, of course, of course. I forget who my second receiver was. It was I said Jefferson? Zay Flowers. That's right. So I said Zay Flowers because it's flag football, right? And Zay Flowers yeah. is like Dante Hall. You can't get a flag off him. Yeah, I mean, he he would be one of them. I'm trying to think because that's what you would want. You would want that that quick hit. I can't touch him. Kind of a player. Like right. you, I'm almost thinking if you want to go deep in the bag. Tank Dell is actually a wonderful pick Tank because good. Tank Dell has insane stop start ability. Brad, so Brad went with Debo as his other receiver, which I I I understand the Debo play and like Debo is not a bad receiver to go with, but Debo's whole thing is like contact balance, right. you know, and you and you don't need that. So I'd probably get I, I I'd have fun and I'd get spicy with it. I'd go Tyree kills in the backfield. Tank Dell is one of my wide receivers, and then Justin Jefferson is the other one, just because he's so he's just too damn natural. I like he's that. He's just so damn good. now defense. So the wrinkle, the change from what we were doing. Now we are we, one pass rusher and four DBs. Basically, is what you're dealing with. Okay, Parsons, Michael Parsons has to be on the football field. <laughs> so you, we have to get him as that like linebacker yeah. player. Yeah, he was the pass rusher, I think, for both of us. He was at least on both of our teams. So I think I think Sauce might be one of my outside corners. I think Jair Alexander is another. Honestly, because of the stop start ability, like I think Devon Witherspoon would be one of them. Witherspoon has some of the most insane click and close ability that I've watched in the league through college football. So I might have Witherspoon as another one. Mm-hmm. And then I get one more DB. Yep. Oh. I feel like I'd play like Jalen Ramsey at safety or something. Like I'd just let Jalen Ramsey roam and be – like Tyron Matthews kind of the same way. You would want a player who just does – who basically just baits the quarterback since you – don't have to play man coverage necessarily. You would basically have like those two guys on the outside, somebody guarding the running back out of the backfield, a guy who is blitzing, and then a safety. The homer in me wants to say like Antoine Winfield Jr., but like Jesse Bates is Jesse Bates would be nasty too. Mm. We had oh, so, so Brad had win. Pat Sertan, Devin Witherspoon, and Javon Holland were his three DBs. My three were Sauce, Trayvon Diggs, best receiver I can think of as a DB. Oh, and, Diggs uh, would be a great flag football corner. And Brian Branch, the man can play anywhere in your coverage unit. I think I would go Sauce, Witherspoon, Jair Alexander, and... Rob, either Jesse Bates or Antoine Winfield Jr. It'd be one of the it, one of those two. One of those two would be going to Paris. I like that as my uh, as Paris. my safety. So those <laughs> I, I just had I wanted to throw the phrase in there. Just going to Paris. So I uh, um, th- that would be my that would be my unit. I'm curious actually. I don't know almost anything in fact about flag football. I wonder whether they play man coverage or zone more. Like, it, if, is there a prevailing style or do they just depends by team? It, it sort of feels like you would just man up the whole time, but I wonder if they do or if they actually have 
you know, you know who would be a good coverage. person to have and ask this question is the person who has played elite, damn near pro level of flag football in Canada. I actually have no idea if that's the case. <laughs> Seth Galina. I just know Seth plays flag football a ton and he coaches flag football. Mm. Um, so he would be the one to actually ask these questions too. But there was... I have to, I have to feel like, I have to feel like you at least have to be able to man up half yeah. of the game. Like, even if you're not doing it the whole game, you got to be able to man up, like, half the game. There was a PFF flag football team that was deployed for multiple seasons, and yet Mm -hmm. the people in the chat that were on that team didn't even know the positions, like, in the team. Like, we were asking, what is what are the five positions for a flag football team? And they were all like, I don't know. But you were on a team. How? What? Two years ago, uh, two years ago, we had a team – from the office, it was me, Renner, right, Austin Gale. Yeah, it was like it, it was like a bunch of like Ben Lindsay, Anthony Trash was on it, like Michael Ayers was on it, like it was it was a bunch of people from the office, and uh, our entire strategy was basically just like get Renner to the football, like <laughs> Renner, like Renner, Renner started at receiver, and it was kind of whoever could get Renner the ball best at quarterback was going to be our quarterback. Cause so, so far I was on the team as well. And then it became when it just needed to be crunch time. We just ran wildcat with Renner and Renner was just quarterback. So we just like cut out the middleman. It was just like, all right, you just get the ball right off the bat. Nice. So that was our strategy. Yeah. Solid one. When I we mean, played. yeah. And, and yet it worked out for nobody us. knew what the positions for flag football were despite multiple iterations of that team. And, and Austin Gale, I must say had to this day, the craziest, full extension diving flag pole I've ever seen in my life. Like laying his body completely on the line to stop a guy from getting a first down in a Monday night wreck flag football league. But that is very Austin Gale of him to do. Nice. Nice. All right. This podcast is brought to you by Prize Picks. Uh, we gave you a little update yesterday on the performance of our guy ZT, Zach Tantillo, on the Prize Picks. The important ones, the ones coming out of Monday Night Football, they hit – uh, other prize picks that he has endorsed in the past week or so, yeah, maybe not so much. Um, what is prize picks? It's a skill-based, real-money daily fantasy sports game. How does it work? You pick two to six players, and if they'll go for more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. Prize picks adds a ton of excitement to the sports viewing experience. Watch your progress, update in real time, win up to 25 times your entry amount, and cash out your winnings with quick scoring, settling, and withdrawals. At prize picks, you aren't competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections. Price Picks entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Price Picks offers frequent discounts, bonuses, and other exciting offers. You can even pick in-game projections after a game has started, which includes halves, quarters, periods, and more. Go to pricepicks.com forward slash PFFNFL and use code PFFNFL for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's prizepicks.com forward slash PFFNFL and use code PFFNFL for a first deposit match up to $100. All right, Trev, next question. This one was from uh, from the Discord. Baby Ben Shapiro brackets wholesome, apparently is this guy's name. Fair enough. Uh, Based on your current knowledge of their personality and the current on-the-field product, which NFL owner would you most like to have a weekly meeting with? And which owner would you least like to have a weekly meeting with? I, I love this oh. question, by the way. Um, right off the top of my head, the first two that I would like to have a weekly meeting with mm-hmm. is Jim Irsay, because... Okay. If that man says too much on social media in which he has to go multiple steps to say things that are too much for an owner to say, I can only imagine the kind of gold that you're getting about not just the Colts, not just him, not just his team, but the entire rest of the league if you are sitting down with him for a weekly meeting. So he is one of them. And then I think David Tepper is the other one because he hasn't been an owner super long so he might not have these like oh you know back in the day crazy stories about maybe some of these other owners but he seems certainly carolina sucks right now so he'd be super pissed (laughs) off and he'd just be one he'd he'd just want to vent so you could learn exactly what's going on in carolina 
But I just feel as though whatever he has experienced over the last couple of years of being Carolina's owner, he would rant about all of it. Like mm. he he would he would give you all sorts of information of like present day stuff, whether it was owner to owner talks or trades that never happened or crazy stuff that's happened with coaches behind the scenes or whatever, like all that. So I am categorizing this as which owners will tell me the most okay and i feel like those two you see i feel like those two could gossip quite you see i'm assuming that this weekly meeting is is over lunch or drinks right it's some kind of sure, you know social right. hangout chat type of deal so i'm kind of like who's going to be the most fun to to be with for a, an hour right over food over drinks and part of that is going to be the gossip you're going to get out of it. Frankly, the obvious and only correct answer is Jerry Jones. Um, clearly, anyone that's listened to this show knows my answer will be Jerry Jones. The only other person I would entertain as being my the, the one that I would most like to have the weekly meeting with would be, is it Rob Walton, the, the one that owns the Broncos now? Like, whichever uh... Walton Dillin, like descendant owns it doesn't really matter. The Walton that owns the Broncos, right? Okay. Only because I'd be curious what an order of magnitude more billions does for that meeting, right? <laughs> Jerry's out here balling with his billions, the bus, the Jerry bus, the star, Dallas, everything around it. Like, it's amazing, right? Jerry's only worth, like, you know, half a dozen billion. Did the Waltons are worth hundreds of billions. What does that do? Does that change the whole thing do you scale up the ballerness when you have that many billions or is it just once you th like clear the threshold of billions it's the same no matter how much you have I, I have no idea how true this is but i'm on wikipedia right now just to see <laughs> just to get the list of nfl owners in front of me and it says that the arizona cardinals owner is michael bidwell yeah. and the the purchase price for the team the last time it was sold was $50,000 in 1932. Okay, yeah. There's a lot of like that, these legacy legacy owners. I don't know. Yeah, none Mc, of them are. It's, it says it says McCaskey bought the team for one hundred dollars. The yeah, Chicago yeah. Bears in nineteen twenty. Well, they were like a founding team, right? So right, there's a right, lot right, of these right. legacy you're, so you're owners. Not, yeah, you're not paying anything for it, but it's hilarious because you scroll a little bit further down and you've got all right, Rob Walton, four point yeah. six billion dollars i mean harris the team the last six time point whatever for the for washington um right. but right. yeah a lot, like a lot of these legacy owners paid almost nothing for the team or you know just the expansion fee of a hundred bucks or whatever it was <laughs> the ursay is like the the colts and the rams were like a swap deal right like they owned the other team and he swapped the rams for the colts it's like it's insane when you look at Dude, where they owner trade yeah That'd be nuts they like, like traded the franchise are traded at the deadline you know or it's not even owner trade because i guess the owners aren't moving like the full franchise is right. moving Back okay so who who's the worst owner to have a weekly sit down over brunch slash drinks with i feel like i don't know enough about like bad owners so i don't I don't really know the answer to this. One. See, I think there's a few that like who, are like... Like, who'd be a bad... I, I don't know. So it's not a bad I owner really thing, don't know, right? Actually. It's not a bad owner thing because, you know, there's... Like, Daniel Schneider was a terrible owner, but he would have been, I think, quite fun to have a weekly drinks meeting with. Like, I think you'd I think you'd enjoy those meetings. If you had a weekly one-on-one -on -one with Dan Schneider over drinks and lunch, I think you'd have found some interesting information, and it probably would have been quite entertaining. But objectively terrible owner. I think the worst buzzkill to have that meeting with is one of these like uh sort of widow owners you know who's like the husband oh. bought the team and now the husband isn't there anymore and they're sort of there with it and you're like eh. yeah but like what if it's a ted lasso strategy where they're just trying to actively tank the team and you actually don't know it so they're not playing well but you know behind the scenes right you know, they but like just trying to tank the team like Gail Benson, who owns the Saints, I think she's selling the team. Like, she, I doubt, has that much interest in the whole thing, you know? And you're just sure. sort of sitting there having, like, tea with an old lady. That doesn't sound like a good time. Look, I got to imagine NFL ownership tea probably slaps, though. So, <laughs> you know, you got to – I mean, I'm trying – I think there's a positive and all. I don't really – I really don't know. I don't I don't have a good answer for, like, who would be the worst NFL owner to, to, to have lunch with. I don't know. Okay. I, at the end of the day, like you said, they're all billionaires. Yeah. So, like, I don't know how – 
I don't know how bad a lunch conversation could go with a billionaire. Like at some point, if they don't, if you're not interested in the football side of things, you're just there for financial planning. Like you're going right. every single month to be like, how do I make money on my money? And they go, all right, here's how you do. Oh it. no, wait. The the obvious one, the mo- the worst one is the the Packers because it's just like Renner. <laughs> Nobody wants that. That's the right answer. I've had lunch with Renner plenty. It's entertaining, but you know, <laughs> Renner or a billionaire. Right. Sorry, buddy. I'm it might be entertaining, but you don't want to like that. That's not as good as going to lunch with Jerry Jones and his baller bus or mansion or whatever he's doing. I forgot it's shareholders. That's a good. That's the right answer. Right. That is the right. That answer. is the correct answer. Okay. We, that, that one sorted. So that was the uh, the question of the week. <laughs> Renner. That was the question of the week from the Discord. Uh, go join the Discord. You'll find the link in the description of this podcast or the uh, at the Twitter account at PFF NFL Podcast. You'll find that. Uh, go join the Discord. Hang out at PFF NFL Pod, I believe, actually, on Twitter. Um, either way, go join the Discord. Give us questions. They will be part of the show, and we appreciate all those people. All right. Uh, next question. This one came from Twitter from somebody called Dreadful. Uh Who would you keep? Yeah, been there. Been there. (laughs) Chase Young or uh, Sweat? Underrated part of this discussion. So they're both uh, contract is expiring. Washington has sort of conspired by not picking up Chase Young's fifth-year option to basically have two young, talented pass rushers headed uh, to free agency or a contract year at exactly the same time with obviously only one franchise tag to potentially deploy between the two of them. And... As this guy says, underrated part of this discussion is they share the same agent. So it's not going to be easy to use one oh, wow. against the other to tag or uh, either keep both, trade one, et cetera, et cetera. So you're basically left with this situation now, if you're Washington, of you're probably only keeping one of these guys, right? Because you only have one franchise tag. So yeah. which one are you keeping? I mean, my immediate answer is, is, is still Chase Young. I think that Montez Sweat has played – like stably well over the the last handful of years so it's not like it's not like sweat would be the wrong choice i don't think but even i'm just looking at the numbers this year Mm. even for the well actually in the years past as well since 2020 sweat who has produced a lot of pressures like the pass rush win percentage which is kind of a, a more individual statistic 10 in 2020 10.2 in 2021 15.6 15.6 last year, 12 point or uh sorry, 16.1 last year and back down towards 11% this year. You look at Chase Young this year and like Chase Young sitting around 20, you know, and so you look at what Chase Young has been over the last couple of years especially given the injury that he suffered, if he's bouncing back and if you say to yourself, "Okay, this is another step in the right direction year for Chase Young and he's already around 20% pass rush win percentage, this is somebody going back to what he was at Ohio State. He was one of the highest graded edge rushers that we had scouted. Like some of his numbers that last year at Ohio State were insane in terms of the the backfield production that he was able to generate. So it's a, you know, there's obviously the caveat in here that it kind of depends what they both want, what they're trying to do. Right. Like if Chase Young is saying, hey, I had one really good, healthy full year. I want you to make me a top five edge rusher. Then it's like, all right, well, Probably not, but if I had to pick between the two, prioritizing one of them, I'm still prioritizing Chase Young. Yeah, it's it's funny. When you look at their sort of uh, overall numbers over any period of time, really the only difference between the two is uh, playing time. Like, it's all the injuries that Chase Young has had and, and right. missed time. Like, in terms of, like, obviously Montez Sweat has been more productive, but it's only really because he's been on the field more. His PFF pass rushing grade since the start of, when did I do this, 2021, so the last three years, including this one, is actually lower than Chase Young's, like marginally, but they're in the same kind of ballpark, 77.5 mm-hmm. uh, versus 75.3. Um, they're in the same kind of area. Uh, pass rushing uh, win percentage, pass rush win rate is actually favors Chase Young. Um, pressure rate slightly favors Montez Sweat, but basically it's the fact that Sweat has got like double the amount of playing time because of all the injuries that Chase Young has had, and because we, you know, we know that backstory of his college production. As you were saying, you assume that there is a better version of Chase Young to come than the one we've seen 
um, from that sort of two and a half year baseline. And actually, mm-hmm. we're seeing that guy this year. Like his pass rushing right. grade is up right. this year. His overall grade is up this year. Like this is the best version of Chase Young we've probably seen in the NFL. So you would assume that if you get him healthy, you get a better player than the one who's basically matching Montez Sweat for production on a per rush basis anyway. It's just the medical thing. Like if you have decided that he's going to be healthy from this point on, he's the guy you keep. If you're yeah, worried about the injuries, you keep the other guy and you accept that you're probably getting a, a less talented or a less impactful playmaker, but one that might be out there for twice the number of snaps. Yeah, again, it kind of depends the kind of money that they're they're both looking for, right? I mean, if Chase Young's saying, hey, I want to get paid like a top, what I said five, but whatever it is, like top eight pass rusher for kind of one year this year, and we're only – but we're not even halfway through, right? So we got a full year to evaluate what he's able to do, how long he can continue to play at a really high level. And even if he does, if he wants to be a top eight pass rusher after that because of where he was drafted and his pedigree and all that stuff. And Montez Sweat is like, yeah, I mean, I'll take you know a pretty favorable deal for the team. Maybe it's a different conversation. But if it's in a vacuum, who are you choosing? Who are you prioritizing? I think Chase Young is obvious given how he is playing this year because if you think, all right, like I said before, this is a step in the right direction. Chase Young still got another step in theory that he could hit. I right. don't know if that's really the case with Sweat. Sweat kind of seems like, hey, 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 he's a good player, but this is what he has been over the last couple of years is what he is. So, if you're, yeah, that would be my answer to that. If you're Washington, would you trade one of them away midseason or just play it out, let, let one of them walk in free agency and franchise tag the other guy? Um. It, it it comes down to how savage you want to be versus how realistic it is. Because to me, it feels like Washington is not complete enough of a team to win enough games or look good enough to where Ron Rivera keeps his job after the end of the season. So if you are moving on from Rivera, you are – Potentially just moving on from Sam Howell as well. Like you might be turn, totally turning the page depending on what pick you end up getting in the draft. And if that's the case, you're kind of in rebuild mode. So yeah, you might as well trade one of those dudes to get some more draft p- picks out of it. But do I think that will happen? No, I don't. Because this current coaching staff is basically in do or die like their their seat is hot so i cannot imagine this team thinks it's a good idea to move on from any of their players or ron rivera won't fight that like hell so ultimately there's been a lot of talk of these guys potentially being movable pieces of the trade deadline i don't think either of them move because washington's just not in that they're not bad enough to fire sale and that's why I think that both of them are still going to remain. They, they just need all the good players that they can get if, the, if this current regime is going to save their jobs. The one thing I think that, that potentially pushes you towards trading one of them is it's that dynamic of they're both represented by the same guy. Like the problem with letting them walk is, or letting one of them walk, is you basically have to use the franchise tag, right? Because they're both represented by the same guy. There's no benefit to one of them signing a deal early and locking themselves up for less money than they're going to get otherwise. So Mm -hmm. the only way of essentially not having to use the franchise tag on one of them is trading them away now so that only one of them is your problem, right? Now, once you trade them, then the guy that stays can actually say, all right, now there is some benefit to signing the deal with the new team because I'm not, you know, we're not battling against the other guy. When you have both of them, I, I don't see any way out of it for Washington other than necessitating the franchise tag use, which you might want to use somewhere else or, or just simply not have that you know, guaranteed money locked up. You might want to sign a better deal long term, which they're just not going to give you. So you know, right. usually you look at this in the sense of where well, you're going to get a comp pick back for the guy that walks anyway and you mm-hmm. get to keep him for the rest of this year. Why would you trade him away now unless the deal is insane? But this is a, like one more layer that actually might make you push in that direction is – being able to get a long-term contract signed with the other guy because of it. Yeah, I, I mean that's a, it's a it's an interesting kind of twist in this situation, but I still I don't think they do it. I, I think that they they basically have to put their best foot forward possible, or they're going they're gonna they're gonna turn the page on a lot of this roster. 
or at least at least the movable parts. Another defensive line they signed a lot of deals along that defensive line, but um, there's just a lot riding on this year. So I would find it hard to believe that they would move on from one of their pieces that would help them right. achieve what they could achieve. Our next partner is AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. I drink it literally every day instead of taking a dozen supplements and pills and all that jazz. One easy drink in the morning for me, and I'm set. Grab it in the morning before coffee, uh, and I'm ready to go to the day for the day with something good in my body, actually feeding it the nutrition it needs. I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure that's why I haven't succumbed to the disease that's ravaging my household from my child bringing it back from school. Um, just just a cold, by the way, not anything you know crazy. I'm setting myself up for success with 75 high quality ingredients that give my, uh, me key daily nutrients and support energy, focus, strength, and clarity. Covering my nutritional basis for the day literally could not be easier which is why I trust AG1. I just mix in one small scoop with water and drink it first thing every morning, done. Uh, if a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com forward slash PFF. That's drinkag1.com forward slash PFF. Check it out now. I, every no matter how Americanized I become, there's certain words that I have to you know Americanize that still like clank in my brain like a bum chord in a piano. And vitamin mm -hmm. is one of those words. Which and what's the verb? What vitamin? Mm. I can't. What do you What do you want to say? Vitamin. Vitamin. Yeah, vitamin. I can't say vitamin without it just like yeah vitamin vitamin sounds really pretentious <laughs> like vit, vitamins vitamins way yeah we can't be doing that over here not stateside brother no we gotta calm that one down we downplay vitamins enough over here we don't true. need them yeah no who needs who needs the vitamins no we do we we actually do though by the age you would probably desperately yeah uh okay this is a desperately, yeah it's true <laughs> we all do this is another question from the discord this is from zach uh 3524 i don't know if those numbers are significant in any way but that's the man's name um, if you're the Bears GM and you trade fields this year uh, for a future second and have the first or second, uh, first and second overall pick and draft Caleb Williams first overall, that's the important part. Forget the trading uh, Justin Fields thing. You draft Caleb Williams first overall and or Drake May. It doesn't really matter. Um, how many picks would it take or be a smart move to make to have you trade out of that second overall pick and miss out on maybe the best wide receiver prospect we've seen in the past 20 years, Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, wide out is a position of high value, but I know PFF always advocates for a trade down when possible. At what point would you take the picks and run or just stick and draft a lock to be a difference maker? So basically, you know, if we assume Marvin Harrison Jr. is a Chase Young, Justin Jefferson kind of instant impact dominating wide receiver, how big yeah. does the trade need to be before you're interested in moving down? Yeah, I mean, I look, if, if the Bears have picks one and two, you're moving on from Justin Fields, you're probably going to get something back from him. You're not going to have a lot of leverage in the situation. So, I, yeah, maybe a second round pick. It might be something closer to a mid round pick that just kind of is what it is, probably for the situation you'd probably be able to make that deal. But if you're picking one and two, you're picking one of the quarterbacks with that first overall pick and then you you and then you are absolutely trading that second pick. Or if you actually like both a lot, like if you like Caleb Williams and Drake May, you can get even spicier and trade the number 1 overall pick knowing that one of them has to guarantee be there for you for number 2. So the number 1 pick and giving the team the ability to choose between the two might be worth I mean if that's think about it. If you're okay with either one of these guys, you think both of them could be franchise changers for you. The difference between trading number one and number two and giving the team that you are trading the opportunity to select one of those guys of their choosing, if if that's worth an extra first-round pick, like if it's two first-round picks on the board no matter what, and then they'll give you an extra third if they can move up to number one and have their choice of the bunch, that's <laughs> that might even be worth it. But ultimately, let's just say... let's. We don't even have to get that tricky about it. Bears pick one of the quarterbacks at number one. To me, you're absolutely trading the pick at number two. I love Marvin Harrison. He's incredible. He's a phenomenal prospect. But to me, the Bears aren't super close right now. They need a lot. And just like the conversation that we had yesterday with the Philadelphia Eagles, 
why are the Philadelphia Eagles in this place where they can always seem to capitalize on veterans that are available and guys that are sliding down the draft, those things? It's because they've set themselves up so well. They have so much future capital, and there have been multiple years where they have had multiple top picks, whether it's been multiple in the first round, multiple within the top 50 or the first two rounds. They have set, they've set themselves up beautifully. If you're Chicago, you have the ability to do that. And you got to think about it like this, too. If you are trading that number two overall pick, there's a damn good chance that that first first round pick that you'll probably get in return is going to be a top 10 pick this year. You know, if it's the Raiders, if it's the like the Vikings, if it like whoever it is, the, the Patriots, if it's these teams that are so desperate to go up and get a franchise quarterback, they're probably picking in the top 10. So you're not dropping down that far. And this wide receiver class is so good. So for as much as I love Marvin Harrison Jr., Trading from two to even, let's say, eight or nine and getting two future first-round picks after this current year, like three in total, that's the win for me. You draft Malik Neighbors at eight, you get your quarterback at the top, and you've got two years to follow of multiple first-round picks. That is the way to do it if you're a GM, if you ask me. So you are actively looking to trade out of that spot as opposed to just if the right deal comes along, you're willing to listen. Like you would be, you get your quarterback think, at one, you're, you're right on the I think the right deal phones. would come along. You know, right. if, if somebody wanted, if somebody was like, hey, we'll give you two second round picks for you to move down seven spots and be like, all right, no, we're not doing that. But the thing is, is that you got to think about it this way. The team that's trading up for you to number two isn't trading up for Marvin Harrison Jr., they're trading up for a quarterback. The price to go get a quarterback in the top three, especially for two guys who are as highly coveted right now as Caleb Williams and Drake May, that's multiple first-round picks. That's the territory that we're talking about. So I wouldn't say that I'm like looking to make a deal because that makes it seem like I would, I'd take anything. Right. But I don't feel as though the Browns would have trouble getting a team to offer them something that they would totally think is worth it, like multiple future first-round picks, because we're talking about them trading up for a quarterback. Yeah, I think the longer we do this, the more I think there is some value in, ironically, the certainty of certain prospects being not just good, but like really good. So the Quentin Nelson mm -hmm. thing, right? One of the... One of the best things about Quentin Nelson was not just how good a prospect he was, but the degree of certainty with which everybody uh, was convinced he would be amazing. Not just he would be solid, he would be amazing. He would be the best guy in the NFL at his position. Now, things have gone off the rails in the last couple of years with injuries, but for a while it was being borne out, right? And that made him not just more valuable than the standard guard in, in the draft, but also uh, it, when he was in the NFL, he was the most valuable offensive lineman at any position for the first few years of his career so I think that starts to increase the uh, reluctance that I would have to move away from a player if I was convinced he's in that category and if he's then in that category as a wide receiver I think that's even more valuable than you know an offensive lineman etc cetera, etc cetera. so it kind of depends just how you view Marvin Harrison Jr. like you know, there's people out there saying he's the best prospect to come along in a long, long period of time, like Calvin Johnson, what was that, 07? Um, going back that kind of length of time. Now, I think wide receiver and that degree of certainty doesn't have necessarily the greatest connection. It's not like offensive lineman where when you're 100% convinced the guy's going to be a star, he's probably right. going to be a star. People thought Charles Rogers was going to be an absolute superstar and the dude was a giant draft bust, right? There's, It's not quite that happy a connection, but... If I was convinced that Marvin Harrison Jr. was like the best wide receiver to come along in 15 years, it would take a big trade to get me to move out of that spot and go down. Even if I liked, you know, Keon Coleman, Malik Neighbors, whoever you want to put in that spot, and the extra mm -hmm. draft picks as well. Like, there's a there's a deal that I would do it for, but it would have to be a big one. I and and look, I hear what you're saying, and it's it's a valid point because I never want to be the draft guy that is always just like, hey, yeah, more draft picks. Like let's like you know like like an addict out here. Like you just <laughs> got to have more draft picks to like scratch the itch. Because I do agree with you. 
for as much as we love to say this guy's going to be great, uh, we think this guy's going to be great in the NFL, it's always think. You don't know. It's a chance. They haven't right. played it down in the NFL. There's a risk to every single selection. We've had quarterbacks go number one overall that we thought were going to be the franchise changers forever, guys who were destined for the Hall of Fame, all that good stuff, and it just doesn't pan out. And that's the story for every single position. So the game of the draft is you are picking higher simply to select the player that you just think has the odds, the highest odds, to hit. And when I look at where Chicago is – I just still see a team that's so far away. So uh, it, you need so much more than even the, just that one position. I think the conversation always completely changes when it is a quarterback because they have such a swing in how good your franchise can be for how long as an individual player. But even the premium positions that come after quarterback, offensive tackle, wide receiver, edge rusher, very important pivotal positions. But if you have the opportunity to set yourself up with multiple first-round picks and a handful of extra top 50 picks, whatever it is, for the next two to three years to follow, to me, that's more worth it. If you're not talking about drafting a quarterback, to me, even for some of a guy who might be a phenomenal player at a really premium position, the team-building aspect of it and getting more of those darts to throw at the dartboard is more valuable to me. I, I do think, though, that if he is the superstar that he's being billed as, I think the Bears are probably closer than you think they are. Like, when we when you saw the impact that Jamar Chase being dropped on the Bengals had, you know, and it's, yeah, sure, Justin Jefferson. Sure. And it's, it's, not, it's, it's not that it would be a bad pick, right. right? Caleb Williams and Marvin Harrison in the same offense, I mean, they're going to put up crazy numbers. That they're, I, I wouldn't doubt that for a second. But, but I think it, it can transform everything. Like, if you drop Jamar Chase on the Panthers right now, we would be talking about that as, like, the best wide receiver core in the NFL because all of a sudden the ghost of Adam Thielen is just, like, a second guy who's doing what he's doing this year. Jamar Chase has taken all the attention away. Suddenly Bryce Young looks viable because he's got guys to throw to. The offensive line doesn't look as garbage because the ball can come out quicker. Like, it transforms everything. I I agree that it 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 makes a difference on the team. I'm not trying to take that away, but like it's it's Jamar Chase's impact on that team like has nothing to do with the defense, no, right? Sure. I mean, the offense is the offensive line would then still be bad. Does he help? Yes, but I just don't think it's as much of an impact as a whole as you are saying in this argument. <laughs> So I'm, I'm I'm pushing I'm pushing back on you. I, and uh, it's yeah, it's a very polite. It, way it is not it. like it would not be successful if they had those two players. But the team building aspect of it, like to say, oh, Jamar Chase changed everything in Cincinnati. I, Lou Anarumo and what they've done and how they've drafted and the players that they got on the defensive side of the ball has played so much of a role of why the Bengals have been good over the last couple of years. J Jamar Chase has changed the offense and it helps change the game. And obviously, he's a big, massive impact type of a player. But to me. Where Chicago is, I think you could get the deal for multiple picks to truly change the franchise in more ways than just drafting that one player. So that's, that's where a, I would stand. It was a very polite way of disagreeing with me, you know. When, I, our, I, you know, I try to not, uh, I try to not be too much of uh, the talking our, heads that we see on some national TV. Our that, standard you know, tone here between me and Steve would be: "You're full of shit. I disagree with what you're saying, and here's why you're dumb." Right? Were you? We're much more polite and, and just, you know, middle of the road. I'm, I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit on what you're saying. I, I don't agree with it, but I'm not going to call you a moron on the show. I, I yeah. appreciate that. Tell me, tell me how much playoff success Calvin Johnson and Matthew Stafford had in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was holding. That's what I was holding back. No, I like I'll, it. Yeah, that's better. Now that you, now that you opened that's it good. up. Okay, we've got one more email to come in before we wrap up talking about the playoffs for a little bit. Um, honestly, I don't even want to spend that much time talking about this cop this topic, but I really like the last line of this email and therefore needed an excuse to read it out. Um, okay. This is from Lewis or Louis Fisher. Hey, guys, the Tuesday show with Sam and Trevor, where Sam was talking about Kirk Cousins being the one that got away from Kyle Shanahan, and Cousins' performance on Monday got me thinking, what would a trade between the 49ers and Vikings look like where the core of it was Purdy being traded for Cousins? Uh, I don't think it would be a straight-up trade. Uh, not sure what side would have to give up more. Shanahan gets the quarterback that got away from him. Cousins goes somewhere he is wanted, maybe. And Purdy gets significantly more affordable housing for his Mr. Irrelevant contract. Thanks again, Louis Fisher. Louis Fisher, whichever. 
So I just like that last line about the affordable housing thing. Um, I honestly, as much as it's a funny idea, I, I just can't see it being in any way, shape, or form practical for, for it to exist. Um, I, do you think Shanahan would do it if somebody offered him the deal? Cousins for Purdy? Yeah. Straight up. No, like, no kickers? You, like, just straight up? I, I mean, you know. The, the, straight up, I think he does. Straight I think up, he, he does trades it? Deal. Yeah. Even so, yeah. straight up, factoring in the fact that you'd have to then sign Cousins to a new monster contract and, you know, it's a massive But game, is it so. going to be a monster contract? Like, what's the Cousins contract going to be? I mean, he's been, he's been like, pushing the top of the league every I time know, he signed but, a contract. Yeah, but he's already done that. Like, if you get to go play with the 49ers and potentially get a couple of Super Bowl runs in here, you give him a three-year contract and you lo- you can make it fully guaranteed, but then just lower the overall deal. Because like, if not, then you don't. Okay, but that is, yeah. like, that is monster relative to the $7.82 that Brock Purdy's being paid right now. I guess. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. So you think Cal, given Cal, Cal Shanahan going to give a shit about the cap space? Yeah, you do it. <laughs> that's John, John Lynch might that's not John do Lynch's it. John Lynch's problem. <laughs> Just get yeah. me my quarterback. <laughs> hey, John, I made this trade. Uh, you can f- figure it out. <laughs> there's going to be like there's that. going to be some salary cap ramifications, but that's your. Yeah, issue. I mean, it is a it is a really interesting question because, like I said, my first answer right there in a vacuum, I would think. You'd certainly do this straight up because I, I believe that Cousins gives you a higher ceiling because of just the experience and the awareness and the things that he has seen um, in this league over the last 10 years where Brock Purdy, for as nice as he's been over the last full year, because it was the last half of last year, first half of this year, that's still, you mentioned it yesterday, on yesterday's show, that's green. We don't have a lot of data. We don't have a lot of games of Brock Purdy to really evaluate. Right. Like We're jumping the shark in a lot of ways, probably on both sides. So I think that Shanahan would make that trade straight up, but uh, I don't know how, I'm with you, I don't know how realistic it would be. <laughs> All right. So let's wrap up the show by talking about the playoff picture as things currently stand. Uh, Timo Riska, uh, PFF Moo on Twitter, has written an article about the statistical chance of all these guys making the playoffs, um, all those kinds of things. Um, I guess, what's your biggest takeaway from this article? So he's drawn up what the current standings look like, the top seven seeds in the AFC and the NFC. Then he's shown uh, what the chances of the of each team making the playoffs is before and after this coming weekend. So, you know, how much leverage essentially is on the line this week for a bunch of teams? Um, How much is at stake for all these sides? And then the various playoff scenarios in terms of who's got the most chance of winning the Super Bowl, et cetera, et cetera. So what was your big takeaway from this article? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, something that I was just shocked to see how much playoff swing we still have with these teams. Like the Vikings, yeah. talk, just talking about them, they play the Packers this week. If they win, Timo Simulations has them at a 64% chance to make the playoffs. And with a loss, it goes down to like 32, which is kind of where you figure the Vikings would be. That's the number that, all right, much less than 50%, less than the coin flip odds to make the playoffs throughout. But if they win, it goes to 64. Like 64 is a high percentage to make the playoffs. Pittsburgh Steelers are the the, the, the exact same way to me. Steelers, uh, man, they started out of the gate really slow, didn't look good, and still at times just like haven't looked good. If they win this upcoming weekend, which the Steelers play, what do they play this weekend? Oh, they play the Jags. They jump all the way up to a 71% chance to make the playoffs. So those were the two big ones to me that stood out. They've got some of the biggest leverage and, and the biggest swing possibilities, but the fact that if they win, both of those teams are very convincingly above 50% to make the playoffs. Uh, that was a that was an eye opener for me. I would not have thought that before reading this article. Yeah, the biggest sort of it's that image. The biggest takeaway for me was just how kind of chaotic the middle of the NFC is. Like half the conference has a massive chance of like still forcing their way into the playoff picture right, with just a right. win this weekend, let alone the next couple of weeks. And the Vikings are actually fascinating because with like the biggest games out of their out of the way already, and not necessarily wins from some of them. They have, in, with wins of three of the last four, managed to crawl their way back to the point where one win gives them essentially a two-thirds chance of making the playoffs. And when you look at their schedule now, 
Like, there's not a really good team on it that, as, as far as we understand them right now, until Cincinnati, week 15, and the Bengals might not be as good as we think they are by the time that rolls around. Detroit, week 16, and then Detroit again, week 18. But, like, Green Bay is this week. You would expect them to win that. So, if they win that, they're up into the 64% chance. The following week is Atlanta. I mean, they're okay. New Orleans, right. Denver, Chicago, Vegas. Like, that's their next run of teams mired in mediocrity. You, at this point, you'll be looking at that and saying, the Vikings should be forcing their way into the playoff picture. On the other side of things, I, I knew it wasn't like great for the Packers, but if the Packers win against the Vikings this week, their playoff chances only goes up to 38%. If they lose, it goes down to 12. Right. So they lose this week, and I, I know some Packers fans are basically already there at that point, but they lose this week, they're done. Like, the season's over, essentially. Like, you're just playing for roster spots next year. Yeah. Which and then, is kind of wild. I didn't I didn't think the Packers were going to be that good this year, but to essentially be eliminated seven weeks into the season, or eight weeks into the season, um, I, didn't, I didn't expect it to look like that. And that's including a crazy comeback win that they had against the saints that probably you know you if you play that second half scenario with green bay and new orleans out 10 times they probably don't come back to win that game nine out of ten times I, so that could have been another loss for the packers and their their hopes could be near zero if they would have actually lost that game looking ahead to this weekend i would argue that maybe the biggest game of the year in terms of leverage so far, in terms of stakes, what's on the line is mm -hmm. Cincinnati playing San Francisco because it's not the biggest um, sort of spread in terms of playoff chance with a win or a loss. But if the Bengals lose, they go down sub tw sub 30% in chances to make the playoffs. If they win, they stay alive and just get to 50-50. But like, you know, a loss to San Francisco who are still, I think, one of the best teams in the NFL, put Cincinnati absolutely with their backs against the wall with very little margin for error to, to make the playoffs again. And even winning the game only gets them to like a coin flip to make it. Like they have dug themselves such a deep hole with that start and with the Joe Burrow injury that they really have very little margin for error. And now the margin comes up against one of the better teams in the NFL, albeit one coming off a couple of losses. Yeah, looking at the numbers, that one is super interesting. I, I'm not, I wouldn't buy the panic as much as maybe the numbers would insinuate. I should with the Bengals, like if they drop it to the to the Niners, what's their schedule moving forward? It's Let's rough. See. That's the problem because they then face Buffalo the next game, Houston, they Baltimore, the, yeah, they Pittsburgh, have the second Jacksonville. Top of the schedule moving forward, right yeah. Now. yeah, like that's that's why they're in in they don't have any margin for error and they're facing a slate of nightmare teams. Yeah, no, I mean, it gets tough for them. I still wouldn't be panicking at three and four if, I, if I'm the Bengals, even with the odds going down to uh, the 30s. But uh, obviously, this is a yeah, this is, this is a very huge week for them. Um, is there a team there that is not in the playoff picture right now that you think has the best chance of like jumping into that spot? Mm. So, current picture if it ended today, Kansas City, Miami, Baltimore. Jacksonville are the four division winners in the AFC, right. and then Pittsburgh, yeah. Cleveland, and Buffalo are the three wild card spots. Uh, the NFC, Philly, Detroit, San Francisco, Atlanta are the four division winners, and then Seattle, Dallas, and Tampa Bay would be the wild card spots. The one that I guess sticks out to me the most, which is crazy that I'm saying this, is the Rams. Ooh. Because if you look at this article... If the Rams win this week, which the Rams play, what do they play? They play the Cowboys in Dallas. So obviously, like this would be a big win if they get this one. Their playoff chances jumps to fifty percent. It's crazy. That's nuts. There's no way this team should have a fifty percent chance to make the playoffs when you look at the roster the way that they're constructed. So that's kind of the one to me where. They're playing teams a lot tougher than I thought that they were going to. This team is just scrapping this year and doing that very well with a lot of young guys, a lot of first-time guys, a lot of rookies. And Matthew Stafford, Cooper Cup, Puka Nakua, what they're doing on offense is 
sometimes been enough to get them more wins than I thought that they would have at this point in the season. So the Rams, I, I wouldn't call them like a legitimate playoff threat, but they are in that conversation a lot more than I thought they were. And even if they don't make the playoffs, Rams could be the biggest spoiler team of any team in this in this league. Like we might look back on it of the teams that made the playoffs versus the teams that just missed the playoffs. And a couple of those teams that didn't make the playoffs, we might be able to point to their schedule and go, damn, that loss to the Rams. That got him. It, it made all the difference in the world. And I feel like there might be a couple of teams where we end up having that conversation with them. The last thing actually that jumped out to me in this article is just how wrapped up almost um, from a, an odds point of view, home field advantage is the number one seed for each conference. Yeah. Like Kansas City is a 57% chance to have the number one Crazy. seed in the AFC. Yeah. And Philly is 47% chance in the NFC with San Francisco, the next best team at 22%. So in what we thought would be like a like bloodbath race for each number one seed in each conference, it's actually looking like just the two Super Bowl teams are going to get back again so far. I mean, the worst odds is essentially a coin flip for Philly to have the number one seed. Kansas City is seen as, you know, 57%. Baltimore with 14 is the next highest in the AFC. It, it's actually crazy that it looks like that. It's just going to be that again. Yeah, early wins. They just put you in such a great situation going down the stretch to where uh, a lot of teams are going to be fighting it out behind you but is anybody really going to be able to catch your win total and i think that's where both of those teams are so yeah it is kind of crazy that it feels like it's almost wrapped up but it does feel like those teams are just going to be the number one seeds again all right that's going to do it for our show today uh thanks for all the questions nfl podcast at pff.com is the email address to send them in or join the discord to uh, shoot questions into the chat there. Check out my uh, pinned tweet to help my YouTube channel do better than my 10-year-old daughters. It's, these are the small wins we got to get in our daily lives. Um, I'll be back tomorrow with Steve. We're going to be previewing every single game of the upcoming week. Big shout-out to Trev for showing up for two days in a row, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.